It is worth noting <clears throat> that many times <clears throat> people pull out the four-letter phrase, WWJD. What would Jesus do? And oftentimes, they mean that to say, Father, be nice. Just say nice, comforting things. And we have to remember, as in today's gospel, Jesus was not afraid to tick people off for the sake of the truth. He didn't do it as a sport, as a game, as a form of entertainment. But Jesus, in preaching the truth for the sake of salvation, did not end up on the cross by preaching pleasantries alone. Now, there are many times throughout the Gospels in which Jesus is comforting, in which Jesus rebukes hypocrisy. But we can't just conceive of Jesus alone as a spiritual teddy bear for my own comfort. We have to take the whole of the Gospel if we're going to be honest Christians. Now, that's not today's homily, though. Go ahead and think about the day of your wedding. Statistically speaking, about 30 to 40% of you had today's second reading in your wedding. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love never fails. I particularly loved uh, the reading today. Thank you, Adele, for reading it so wonderfully. And for the decades of your marriage that are behind your proclamation of the reading. Thank you. The beauty of love being patient, of love being kind, is it underlines a necessity of love, a necessary truth of love. That love is a choice. Love is not just a feeling. Now, you who are married know far better than me the reality that love is a choice, that showing up in your marriage day after day is a choice, and it's not just about how you feel. This past week, I had the utter blessing of my priesthood, and this comes up every few months. Almost weekly, I might be at somebody's deathbed going to Porter Hospital, Swedish, to a home visit, a nursing home, wherever I am. But not always is all of the family present. This past weekend, I got to kneel at the bedside of a dying woman whose husband of 55 years was there at her bedside. And accompanying them were their three children, and multiple grandchildren. And the beauty of this encounter was I led her through a final confession, the fruit of which is great peace. Then the family all coming back into the room, we give her anointing of the sick, the union of her own suffering at the end of her life with Jesus' suffering on the cross for the sake of spiritual fruitfulness, for the sake of that soul, and overflowing to the life of the family. But then after the anointing, we all knelt down, the oldest child first at her bedside. And this woman put her hand on the head of her first child, traced the sign of the cross, an act that she had done decades prior when she first brought her child into the church for baptism tracing the sign of the cross as a gift of faith. Now, as she begins to depart this world, she leaves behind a legacy of faith, not only overflowing from her marriage, but for her own witness of the practice of her faith. And then tracing the sign of the cross, she begins to give each of her children and grandchildren to Jesus, saying, Lord, I give you my firstborn. Take care of her. And then praying over each child, entrusting different things, facets of their life to Jesus, she moves through everyone and finally she gets to her husband. And her husband kneels down at her bedside 
And if you think about it, this mirrors that moment many decades prior when he knelt down offering his life in service of her. When the man kneels down as an act of submission of strength, to love and honor, to guard and protect her all the days of his life. The beauty of their vows coming to this point of culmination at their deathbed. Because their vows are till death do they part. Clearly, there were many tears in this moment. It was so utterly beautiful. And I spoke to them that the goal of every marriage is to have one spouse accompany the other faithfully to the deathbed, offering that soul to Jesus. And the beauty of that is, when that soul goes to God, that soul from the heights of heaven will be able to usher the soul left on earth into heaven as well, through the intercession, through the mystical body, through the church triumphant. This is the beauty that is marriage. And the splendor of holy matrimony is vastly underappreciated, especially in the Catholic world. Far too often, we priests get pedestaled as the ones who are holy. Uh, uh, uh. If I'm holy, it's not because I'm a priest. If I'm holy, it's because I'm a follower of Jesus. And it's because of the love that he pours into my heart. So too it is, brothers and sisters, with you. You are no less holy, nor are you called to any less holiness than a priest or a pope. And the beauty of your marital life is one of self-gift, such that new life coming forth from your marriage, our Lord uses your marriage, that relationship of trust, as the point of formation for the most impressionable of all of God's creatures. A human infant, a human baby, a human toddler, and a human child. Your marriage, your home is to be the first school of love, to be the first school of forgiveness, to teach your children how to deal with bearing wrongs patiently, to deal with having a bad day, how to live sacrificial love. In the preface for the Mass of Holy Matrimony, these words are, pray, are prayed. Now remember, the preface is, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. And then there's a paragraph of theology <clears throat> that's kind of stuck into every Mass. This one for the Mass of Holy Matrimony says, for you have forged the covenant of marriage as a sweet yoke of harmony and an unbreakable bond of peace. Marriage, holy matrimony, is supposed to be an unbreakable bond of peace. Peace not by way of moral perfection, not because you're all that and you're carrying this marriage all by yourself, but because you kneel at the feet of God, begging for his grace, begging for his strength, so that you can be a spouse who pardons, a spouse who loves, a spouse whose love never fails because your love is connected to the love of God. Now look at that image for a second. A sweet yoke of harmony. By yoke, we're not talking about that yellow thing in your egg. That yoke is a very heavy piece of wood placed over the shoulder, shoulders of oxen or another beast of burden so that the plowing of a field can be done more effectively. If you've ever dug a hole, it's always harder than we think it is. 
Try plowing an entire field. But the most efficient way is getting two oxen so their strength is shared. The plow going between them, they're able to upend the dirt so that seeds can be planted, so that new life can come into the field, so that people can be fed. But take those two oxen. That yoke that goes on the shoulders of each limits their freedom. The ox can no longer move wherever it pleases. It is driven in a unified direction, the two of them together. And together, they're able to do more work than one would be able to accomplish by itself, to drive more steadily, deeper into the soil, for the survival of humans. This is how you and I are here, because our ancestors survived the winter, because they figured out yoke and oxen. This is the image the church gives to you who are married. And you know far better than I do that marriage is a sacrifice, that marriage is tough, that marriage is a certain death to self, a limitation of your freedom if you believe freedom is doing whatever you want. But if freedom is doing the good for you and those that you love, then a yoke actually hones in your God-given freedom, unifying you and your spouse to be able to accomplish what you yourself could not do by yourself. Clearly, biologically speaking, no human being can just propagate children on his or her own. So your children, given by God, are a gift of your spousal unity. But so too, through your children and through the sacrificial love of your spouse, the sacrificial love of your children, the Lord draws out new capacities of your heart to be able to love in ways that you never imagined and that you could never have accomplished by yourself. This is the gift. This is the grace that is holy matrimony. And by it, the Lord is drawing you closer to himself day by day, strengthening you by his grace. It is precisely by this love, by his love, by the truth of his love, that love never fails. For whatever marriage is grafted to the cross of Christ and offered to the glory of God the Father receives an unfailing strength of love. Clearly, I don't need to preach to you about the beauty of mass attendance. You're already here. But may your marriage be undergirded, supported, and strengthened by God's grace, by the gift of prayer, by the sweet yoke of harmony that is sacrificial love. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. To echo what Teresa said in the beginning of Mass, we want you to sing. If you're one of those people that's like, Father, you don't want to hear me sing, I have an ugly voice. <laughs> I want to hear you sing. And if you have an ugly voice, that's not your fault. <laughs> it's God's fault. So make him listen to it and then pray for it to get better. But we want you singing in this Mass. This is a wonderful community of word and song. And our worship of God through our prayer, through the, our hymns, is a beautiful thing. So just underlining uh, what was said to you at the beginning of Mass, it's a beautiful thing to sing, especially if you're just one of the awkward singers. Thank you. Lastly, there's that part of the Mass where we say, pray, brethren, pray, dearly beloved, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Week to week, you are living sacrifices in your marriage, in your motherhood and fatherhood, in just your daily life of being a Christian. And when we come together as a community of the baptized and we offer our sacrifices at this altar, just as the bread and wine are, are offered and then they are transformed truly, not symbolically, into the body and blood of Christ, so too our sacrifices are transformed 
truly, not just symbolically, in our way of living. The Lord takes the sacrifices of our life, of our marriage, etc., and he repurposes them for us, invisibly and immeasurably, but he is at work. The beauty of marriage and sacrifice in marriage is that if you break sacrifice in half, sacrifatre, it means to make holy. And so the beauty of the living of the sacrifices of your life, week in and week out, offering them here, is the Lord is making you holy. And in so doing, he's preparing you to live in a civilization of his true love. That's heaven. That's all eternity. Your marriage is preparing you for heaven. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life.